the fondest memories would would involve probably Grimes Drugstore and Ricketts Drugstore um, <laughs> until they tore down that whole block where Ricketts was. Mason Insurance Agency was over top of Ricketts from when it was built in like 1911 or 12 till they tore it down. So that's Mason Insurance Agency was right over top of Ricketts. You, you kind of went up the stairs between Ricketts and where Craft and Sparks was. And I remember someone said it was 23 stairs straight up. And, and, and the funny thing is, and he ended up being dad and Lacey's partner as Ben Hargett called on him from insurance companies before he moved here. And he actually slipped and rolled, fell down those stairs. Rolled down, he didn't <laughs> break anything. But he, he said he thought he'd never get to the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've been been here my whole life, and mm -hmm. the fondest memories would have to be Ricketts and Grimes Drug Store, and then uh, Little League over at Porterfield Park. That uh, the businessmen in Orange were worried that Sizemore was so so such a good coach that he's going to get hired away. They had to figure a way for him to stay in town. So in night 1960, they started Peanut League here in Orange, and coach, they had. Major League, which was 10, 11, and 12, and under 10 was the minors, and uh, Sizemore was, uh, ran it, and they paid him so much per summer to run it. And it was a good amount of money at that time. Now, this was baseball, not football. This is baseball. Right. And funny thing is, if you ever ask Larry Haney, he, he thinks Sizemore's probably a better baseball coach than a football coach. Hmm. That's interesting. And I played his last year as a baseball player in 65, 66, my junior year. And the school board made him give up a sport. He was athletic director and head coach of football, wrestling, and baseball. And, yeah, he had a lot of power. And there were some people that didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And so his last year, we were... 14 and one, won the district. We lose two people, Gordon Tucker and Bill Morton. Everybody else is back, a couple of others. And we go nine and seven the next year with someone else coaching. Mm -hmm. That's that's the difference he made as a coach. Yeah. Now you remember playing some uh, pickup basketball games, don't you? Oh yeah, up at, um, you know, they talk about when schools integrated, but they had two basketball coach courts up at the old Orange Elementary School um, on the right side of the school. And uh, we played up there, blacks, whites, whatever. Never remember a fight or anything. It was, it was um, Clarence Sneed worked for the post office for years, and he came back from Vietnam, and he came up there and played. And... I was one of the bigger, bigger young guys then, and um, so he he beat on me. <laughs> he he claims I was a good basketball player because he toughened me up. <laughs> but um, yeah, we we had great games up there, and um, they used to play. We used to play some over here on the other side of Church Street, between the end of Church Street and the railroad tracks. There's a some area over there, and we we go down there and play uh, play football. Now, you uh, went to Orange County High School, mm -hmm. uh, lettered in three sports? Mm -hmm. Football, baseball, and basketball. And um, uh, the year that you were on the football team, was that the year, that was the, the glory days of Orange County High School's athletics, wasn't it? Well, I think the glory days started kind of when Sizemore got here, but uh, his second or third year. So he, uh, his first undefeated team was 1955. Mm -hmm. Ralph Nichols played on, I remember, I know that. And then he had some more undefeated teams and the 65, 66 football team was my junior year and we were undefeated. And we beat Stafford 13 to 12 down there and they had us beat 12 nothing at halftime. We beat them 13 to 12. And the only other clo the closest other games were Culpepper and James Rowe who beat them twenty seven to nothing. And we had five shutouts, beat Spotsylvania sixty six to six. It was just <laughs> it was like 
show up, we're going to win. Have a good game. Mm-hmm. And that no, you didn't. You weren't cocky like that. Sizemore would never put up with that. Uh, he he respected the other team and res- he respected the the people. You got to respect the people you're playing against. And he preached that. Um, but he he was. I lived next door to him, so I got to know him pretty well. Where was that? Uh, I lived on East Main Street right behind my grandmother's house. Uh, if you go at East Main Street and it levels off before you go down to Red Hill Road, there's a stone wall on the left-hand side. And that older house there was my grandparents. Mm-hmm. When it was built in 1921, it was the farthest east house in the town of Orange at that point. The pictures from behind it, you just you see Dad and my Uncle Billy Meredith Scott sitting there with pictures and beside the house and looking at there was, there was no green fields there was nothing behind it it was just there was green fields the estate was there but other than that it was just that and um, it was fun uh, dad built right behind my grandmother's house and I got to watch green fields being uh, J.P. Walters with Hope Clark running the grader did the road to, to the original green fields and back in those days, a little kid could go play. I'm a little kid. I was, uh, I don't ever remember being really little, but I was, I was 11 or 12. I could go down. I could jump in a dump truck and ride with uh, Mr. Walter's brother, or I'd get on the grader with Hope. They weren't worried about anyone falling, getting hurt, and suing them. Um, and then you rode your bicycle everywhere else. I rode my bicycle to Orange Elementary School as soon as my parents would let me. They had a bike rack up there. You could ride your bike up and back. Mm-hmm. That worked well, except if it rained. It was rain at the end of the day. You had to leave your bike there and uh, and get a ride home. Mm-hmm. Um, after high school, you went where? Um, I had a basketball scholarship to VMI. I stayed there for a year, and the military and I didn't necessarily work out. So I, I came... Uh, I, I went back for three or four weeks. My sophomore year just was miserable and called Dad and said, I'm coming home. And um, I had to sit out the rest of the semester and then I had to go to, I had a scholarship offer from Gettysburg and it was still open, but they couldn't give me a scholarship if I was ineligible. And if you transferred then, and I think it's true now, and your parents don't move, this is college, you have to sit out a year. So I basically borrowed $8,800 from uh, Na- uh, National Bank and Trust. Ed Woodward was there. And I borrowed it and paid my first year tuition up at Gettysburg with that. With the understanding from my father that if I graduated with a 3 average, he would pay back the principal. I'd work every year to pay the interest on that money. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny that... I graduated with a 2.99, and Dad was saying something about it, and his friends Robbie Robertson and V. Shackford gave him a hard time. Says, last thing I know, insurance companies would round that, round that up to a 3 <laughs> So he did. He, he finally got to the point. I said, well, Dad, if you're not going to pay it back, I'm not either because I don't care what my credit is. Of course, then I went after college, I went to work for a bank. <laughs> what you're supposed to care about, what your credit is. Um, that was in Baltimore. Maryland National Bank, downtown Ten Light Street, downtown Baltimore. So tell me when you came home. I came home um, July of 1975, as a matter of fact. And been here ever since. Yep. Um, I had to, had to talk my wife two years out. She loved Baltimore and she grew up in Scarsdale, New York and kind of sort of a city girl. But I talked her into coming back and she taught over in Madison for two years and we had three children. And then she went back and taught Head Start here for 40 years. And uh, I, I'm very fortunate that there are a lot of people that would have married someone that wouldn't have wanted to move to Orange, wouldn't have lived in Orange. And I'm fortunate she did. It took some adaptation on her part, though. <laughs> yeah, having to explain to her that there were absolutely more cows and pigs and horses and goats in, in Orange County than there were people. 
<laughs> it's a little hard for her to understand coming from a big metropolitan area. Right. right, right. Um, Chuck, your grandfather started Mason Insurance, is that correct? There was another Mason in a Shackerford that started it in 1891. And um, he came here from King George in 1908. And then he bought into Mason Insurance Agency. And I believe, and I believe he got his money from V. Shackford to do, or the Sha v, V's dad, Mr. Shackford Sr., because um, they owned some stock in the agency um, for a long time. Now, that's the, the oldest continually operating business in the town of Orange, correct? I think we are owned by the same family. Yeah, I think I think even not owned by the same family. Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Barton bought into it in 1908 and married my grandmother uh, like a year later. Chuck, I mean, today, uh, Mason Insurance Agency is in its fourth generation of, of Masons. Isn't that correct? Yeah, Whitney's the fourth generation. So you've got to be pretty proud of that. I am. And uh, people ask me, why are you still working? And I go, well... With all the operations on my legs and feet and stuff, I can't play basketball and tennis and golf. I mean, I'm. Someone said you're the eight million dollar man, and I said no, I'm not. I think my wife thinks I'm a dollar sixty eight guy. But her, and my friends have told her that if I ever died, just to get me cremated and keep all the titanium in my body, <laughs> it'd be worth something. <laughs> but um, no, uh, uh, and. I think Whitney likes what she's doing. Um, uh, I, uh, I wish she'd moved to Orange from where she lives up in Albemarle, but uh, that's not a requirement of working there. And um, and I mean, Brian's the second generation of his family that's in that. And uh, if his son or daughter ever wanted to come back in the agency, I wouldn't object at all. Um, but uh, I, I'm still involved in the independent insurance agents on the legislative committee. And yeah, we, um, I don't think there's another agency in Virginia that I'm aware of that's still, most of them sold out to banks. And the reason they did is the principals did not have any good retirement planning of plan. And the banks, all of a sudden realize, hey, these insurance, they're, they're making good money. So they started buying insurance agencies. And some of them were kind of throwing funny money at them. And uh, we had a chance, I, 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 Ben and I had a chance to sell the agency to a bank. And all we had to agree was to work for five years. So I, I took the offer home and showed it to my wife. I said, okay. I can pay taxes and net enough off this. You, you want your house down at Nag City? Not going to be oceanfront, but be close. And she thought about it, and uh, and her point to me was, you know, Chuck, you're you're used to working for yourself, and they going to work for somebody else. You used to work for a bank, and you weren't, you know, you left that. Um, says, yeah, we, I, the money would be nice, but she says, I think the older you got, you'd be miserable working for someone else. So we didn't take the deal or do the deal, and that's let and, and that's let Brian come back and he and Ben worked out whatever it is with their stock and and the Whitney's now back too. So it's it's allowed us some independence, not to take off on the independent agency thing. It's allowed us some independence to do things with our family and personally that we might not otherwise have been able to do if we sold out to a bank. One of the things I've noticed is that. Whenever there is a, a good cause happening here in the town of Orange, one of the sponsors, 99% of the time, is going to be Mason Insurance. Yeah. We, we try to, you know, you have to support the people that supported you. And you have to give back. And I have no problem doing that. And we don't have a budget each year. It kind of depends on what comes up. And um, I, 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 I try to support anything locally that I think is a good part of the community, could be a good part of the community, um, or helpful to the community and, and the people working there. And 
um, I have no problem with that. You know, the, like Dad said, there, uh, you know, there are no luggage racks on ca on caskets, so you might as well do what you want to do while you're here and can do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I seriously, I'm, I believe that, and I firmly believe that. It's not just because I was on the town council, because I've lived here. Uh, this is an incredible place to be able to grow up and raise a family. And kids can still walk downtown if they want to here. It's, I'm not saying it was, it's the way it was in the 50s and 60s when I grew up, but it's still, you know, I don't think your kid's going to disappear if you're walking downtown. That doesn't mean some crazy person can't come along and take them. It's, it's a different world now. And right. The things we hear, it just you just shake your head and go, I can't believe that. Right. Um, uh, you mentioned town council. How long were you on town council? Um, I ran for it and was elected and did two, two four-year terms. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, you know, some people want me to get on town council. What do you think? He said, well, do you like the town? Do you, do you want to stay here? Well, if you think you can make a difference, go ahead. See if you get elected. Um, and uh, so I did. I was on for two terms, two four-year terms for eight years, and I got off. And I was off for six years, I believe. And there was a meeting at Atwell Somerville's office up there, and some people, Henry Carter called a meeting, and there were a bunch of people getting together. And I, they said, hey, Chuck, come on up. we got to talk about the town election. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll come up. And we're sitting there talking, and I finally said, hey, guys, it's, it's Saturday morning. It's nice. I enjoy seeing all you all. What are we talking about? And they said, well, we're talking about you running for town council again. I go, we are? <laughs> and, and I had just had this knee replaced. I'd already had this. And I'm walking with the crutch. I said, I can't go out and get all these signatures. And I'm, no, I'm, I, I just, I don't want to and can't. They said, we're not asking you to. I said, we'll get the signatures. The point, the question we're asking, if your name's on the ballot and you're elected, will you serve? I go, yeah, I will. So <laughs> Brian <laughs> kind of said, Chuck, you've set the standard for being on town council now. It's like, don't do anything, get elected. And then they turn around and make you mayor. <laughs> so, and and I will tell you that, um, yeah, being mayor, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I, I I don't mind voting on difficult issues or and you know having an opinion and 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 luckily the councils I was I was with or worked with all got along well together and respected each other. And it, it was a, the, my eight years on there was a good experience for me. Uh, what were some of your signature uh, accomplishments uh, as mayor? I think my the best accomplishment I had was, uh, I'm not going to say his name, getting rid of the town manager we had and hiring Greg Woods. I think Greg Woods, with his knowledge and his financial background, he worked for a big coal company. Um, the employees respected Greg. He knows the money. He knows where all the all the uh, uh, the bones are buried, and he uh, he's. I think he's been excellent for the town of Orange, and uh, he's just financially so astute. Excuse me, and. And trained that um, now it's not the little old town of Orange. I mean, with water and sewer, and I mean it's a big budget. Yeah. While you were mayor, you all had to deal with a, a lot of water and sewer issues, didn't you? Mm-hmm. When they did the sewer plant, there was talk of zero percent money, but to do it. You had to, we were told our rates were too low and we would have to raise our rates. And I'm not naming names, but there are a couple of people on the council that said, we're not increasing water and sewer rates. Okay, so we get a loan and it's, I mean, it's 21 million, it's some, it's some 20 some million. And the interest rate was like, I can't remember, it's 1.9 or two. It was 
some amount of money that's still significant with that that much of a loan. And uh, Greg and I went down to Richmond and talked to him down in Richmond. And I said, what do I have to do to get this thing lowered to zero? Can I? And they said, well, and they came back and said, well, we think, we think that your water and sewer rate ought to be in such and such. I said, I said, yeah, we can do that. And so to go from like 1.9 or 2% on 21 million to zero, that's a lot of money each year and a lot of money over the 20 some year term of a loan. And, and that's what I'm kind of proudest of is that it, it didn't do anything for me. People don't even know what went on, but it saved the town of Orange a lot of money. 50 years ago, there were a lot of retail businesses here in town and they're not that many now. What happened? I don't really know. I think some of the businesses were family owned businesses that didn't have family that wanted to stay in the businesses and didn't think they could earn as much money here as they could going to work for somebody else. Um, I think that that's part of the problem. Um, and, and, and it's true. Families start businesses, but once you get a generation or two in, you better have a continuation plan set up or funded or it's just going to go away. Um, so I, I don't think orange did anything wrong. I just think there are a lot of opportunities away from orange. And I know that I consider myself very fortunate that I wanted to come back here from Baltimore and I had, I could come back to a business and, and work in orange and, you know, support my family, raise my family, get to coach all kinds of little league sports and things. That's wonderful. I couldn't have, I, I, I feel like I'm one of the most fortunate people on earth with people from that come through orange and stop and visit or go to the museum or go to functions here and have been here and have moved here. I think they find that the town of orange and the County of orange is a very welcoming, nice place to be. It's not the good old boy network that they used to have here. It's just who's here wanting to do good things for the area. If they are, let's support them.